Welcome to the 17th episode of Season 3 of the Ubuntu UK Podcast. It's Saturday the 25th of September 2010 and we are live at the University College Dublin for OSS Bar Camp. Way. <laughs> Come on! <Hey. laughs> better than that! Better. Thank you! It does say pause for applause. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> In this episode, we are going to talk about the commercialization of Linux distros, challenging our prejudices, and paying to use your computer. We will also cover the latest news. I'm Dave, and with me this week in Dublin is Tony. Hi, Dave. How are you doing? It's nice to be here. It is nice to be here. And, um, and Alan's here as well. Alan yes. and I both got up very early this morning to be here. I yeah, we flew in together. Too. Yeah, that was a, a, an interesting experience. Mm. Mm. Mm, what happened to you? Well, well, first of all, we got on the plane. I mean, it's been a long day. I think we both got up about four o'clock this morning. I slept in my daughter's bed last night. Nothing weird. <laughs> I put my daughter in my bed with my wife, and I slept in my daughter's oh. bed because I'm kind like that, and I didn't want to wake them up. So I thought, I'll set my alarm for half mm. past four, or four, no, four o'clock, yep. and sure enough, it went, ah, 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 and woke me up and didn't wake anyone else up. So that was cool, and then get to Tony's for half past, no, motorway closed, so I'm driving down the motorway and there's a big sign that says motorway closed. So I get off the motorway, get to Tony's. And, and you, you walk into our front room, which is where we normally record the, uh, the podcast. And the first thing he says is, oh, it looks like a living room. Yes. Which is it, what it normally is. It normally is a living room when you're not there to record a podcast. I only know it as Studio A in yeah. the podcast. I don't actually know it as a living room. And then we got to the airport, got on the plane, everything was, was hunky-dory. Oh, um, apart from getting various grooming products removed from us in security. Yeah. So if we smell, sorry. Yeah, but that's because we've had it all taken away. It'll from be us. a lot worse tomorrow than it is today. Um, and we got on the plane, all set to take off. They pushed us away from the building, and then they said, "Oh, I think computer there's something says wrong no. with this." Yeah, basically, computer says no. I think there's something wrong with this plane. We're going to have to get you all back off. It's, they said it was a minor computer fault, to which the obvious response of "Have you turned it off and on again?" <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, was never far from our lips. And they took us all off. We sat around for about two hours. Um, and then we got on a, another plane, which did work. So if you were trying to go to Manchester from Southampton Airport this morning, you st- stood no chance because we were on your plane. I, I, I think our audience here today, I think there's a very low chance very low of them chance. Yes. trying to do but, that. But I'm aware it, we are recording this for other people potentially at some point in the future. <laughs> if they were trying to go to Manchester, then they failed in that then. Because <laughs> they yeah. got here. They, they were on the Manchester plane, but they ah. turned up here. <laughs> yeah. But the, the great thing was when I got to the, the desk to get back on our second plane... The woman said, show me your boarding card. And I was like, well, it's in the po- seat pocket in the plane that's broken that's over there. <laughs> and she said, okay, stand there. So I had to wait while they let everybody else onto yeah. the plane. And I'm standing there looking like a lemon. Everyone's not on the plane. They're on a bus, which is going to take you to a plane which is just 50 feet away. And they're all wondering why I'm standing there. And it's because I haven't got a boarding card. So she says, okay, well, I'll have, to, I'll have to generate you a new boarding card. And unfortunately for the people listening, they won't be able to get this. This is my boarding card. It's a... <laughs> It's a pink piece of paper with my name and my seat number on it. And that's my boarding card. And I tried to, you know, that, that, I'm keeping that. Yeah. yeah. And but we uh, got here. So how was your journey, Dave? Uh, um, mine was eventful. Eventful, okay. And um, I, I, I'm, I, I don't... Uh, I heard you had a bit of trouble... You got me a bit the, tongue-tied here, Tony. I heard you had a bit of trouble getting to the check-in. Uh, yes, yes. It was uh, an emotional journey. Um, I, I, I don't think I'll go into too much detail. No. I, know, yeah. I noticed you're wearing flip-flops, I was going to say... Oh... Okay, there are your, are your shoes? There's, there's a certain Irish-based airline, and I don't think the audience will need to guess which one. <laughs> <laughs> and they are... I, I'm lost for words, I really am. Oh, um, nice. uh, they, 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 they closed the bag drop early, so essentially I've pretty much only got what's on me. Um, I had to leave a couple of laptops in my car, I had to run. I mean, I'm a geek, I don't run. In flip-flops. In flip flops, I would have flip-flops. loved to have seen that yeah. somewhere. Oh. There's some CCTV and footage that is priceless. And the thing is, I mean, on an A4 piece of paper, yeah, which Ryanair, um, Oops. You, <laughs> 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 um, which and many other airlines um, <laughs> make you do, um, they, they make you print your own, which is, it isn't really a boarding pass. It's really a uh, an advertisement. But you know, they sort of put that across. But looking at the dimensions of it. Um, if, I, if you imagine across the bottom part, that's where the sort of boarding section is. And that's what they tear off to keep. Now, to me, to try and orientate that is actually quite easy. 
this little section is what's left of my boarding pass. She just teared it in bits because she, she was holding it the wrong way and teared it in half rather than the bottom part. That's outrageous. I know, and I want to keep this as a souvenir as well. Do you have a souvenir boarding pass? I have my actual boarding pass. Oh, well, get you. You didn't leave it in the seat in front, did you? Yeah, exactly. I didn't leave in the seat of the plane, and I didn't get ripped in half. I'm sorry if that makes me special. Anyway, we better get on with it. We've got some um, thank yous to do um, for the sponsors for the event, but also a big thank you to Laura, who waited for us this morning um, in the airport for several hours, oh, yes. and um, also has been very helpful organising things like all this bits of kit that we need to record the show and so that you can hear us at the back and everything. So it's been almost like having like our own kind of tour manager. It's been great. So thank you very much indeed, <laughs> <Roadies>. Laura. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Laura. Plus, of course, all the work that she's done to organise the rest of the event, but, you know. Oh, also to that. Sorry, that's got my name next to it, hasn't it? That means me. <laughs> I'll get reading one day. Uh, Ubuntu Island. There is that the Ubuntu Island loco for organising this whole thing. Thank you very really? much. Oh yes, <laughs> we've got Enterprise Ireland. That's supposed to be Enterprise. Oh, oh okay. Oh, sorry, I'm just reading what's on the paper, Tony. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, UCD NetSoc, who I guess would be uh, the local group, um, student group. Yay! Yeah, Congratulations, guys. Thank you. Black Knight Solutions. Who's Black Knight? That's you. That's you. You That's that are man. Black Knight. He's a Black Knight. His armor's at home. <laughs> In a grey jumper. And Hail. we've got the Linux Fund. They're the credit card people, aren't they? Yeah, they are. You can get a credit card and give donations to Floss Software by spending money Fantastic. on proprietary stuff. And why is it it comes all around to me to say thank you to Microsoft? Just co- it's <laughs> just coincidence. <laughs> okay, thank you, Microsoft. Yeah, indeed. Thank I'll, you I'll say thank you to Microsoft Yeah, thank as you, well. Microsoft. Why not? I don't really do and um, Ken McGuire um, and Paul O'Malley, who have supported the event by providing all the audio kits, kits so we, you couldn't hear us if it wasn't for them. So thank you very much indeed to those guys. So the first segment, I, I saw a blog post recently from uh, someone at Canonical, and it got me wondering. Um, it's about a new... Um, a new product from Canonical, but it's branded Ubuntu, and it's called Ubuntu Pay. Now, Ubuntu has always been and is intended to always be a free distribution, and um, you can get your CD and you can install it, and you never have to pay anything for it. But I wondered what this Ubuntu Pay was, and it's, it's kind of tied in with all the other value-add services that you get from Canonical. So we've got a music store, uh, we've got a file synchronization service, and we've got other services. And it kind of worried me that we're using this name, Ubuntu, in a product called Ubuntu Pay, when we're trying to also send the message that the software is completely free. And that kind of worries me a little bit. Um, and it ties in with the whole commercialization of the whole of Linux, not just yeah. Ubuntu. Not, I'm not saying that's the only uh, issue. No, and certainly, you know, Ubuntu One has commercial services attached to it. You can pay extra to get more storage and things. Um, and we basically wanted to ask you guys what you think of the commercialization of Linux distros. Is this idea of Ubuntu Pay being able to pay for a specific applications through the Ubuntu One software center, sorry, the Ubuntu software center, uh, a good thing, a bad thing? Um, uh, is, is it, it good? Because the, the idea is that we, in late, new versions of Ubuntu, we'll have a software center and... It's basically like Synaptic, but it's a friendly version of Synaptic, the package manager, and you'll be mm. able to press a button and buy software rather than, as you normally do, you just hit the download button and you download it. It's something most Linux users don't seem um, familiar with, is buying software, apparently. Um, and we wondered how people felt about that. I think it's great. <laughs> I'm going to say that. I think it, it will help get more uh, independent software vendors on side. I think we will see um, commercial software coming to Linux that people don't have to use but can choose to use if they want to. And uh, it's a good revenue stream for Canonical, potentially, who, as a, the company who support Ubuntu, have, uh, do great things and we need to carry on supporting them. That's what I think. And they also pay his salary, so somewhat <laughs> well. It was just about <laughs> some of it. It was just about to issue a shoeing to them, I think. Uh, so, I mean, what's the difference between this and the Canonical shop that already has, for example, DB2? Uh, you buy that, and I believe you get a URL where you can download this £2,000 piece of software. Well, there's a difference between the, um, the the software of the type of DB2, which is enterprise software, and people have a, perhaps a greater understanding of the support requirements. And, oh, look, I can install the commercial version of uh, Acrobat Reader rather than the native Ubuntu PDF reader. Yeah, people can search for those things within the software center like they could search for anything else. Why is there a difference between com- um, enterprise-level commercial software and um, desktop user-level commercial software? The price. 
well, yeah, but I meant philosophically. There's no philosophical well, difference it, it, between buying software for an enterprise and buying, you know, Sage for a small enterprise and buying a game for a desktop. I, I think he means, for example, using Oracle to host your one-page homepage. Would you do what? Uh, no, you this is what I mean. The, the sort of difference between enterprise grade and uh, and and. Are you saying enterprise software is better? I'm no, saying you're not, you're not going to impulse buy DB2. <laughs> you're not going to come home from the pub one night after one too many beers, download Angry Birds and Oracle onto your iPhone. <laughs> Fair point. No. So I think you know, if, there's, if there are things that are right there, a little gooey, and they're a couple of quid or a few quid, maybe like, you know, I don't know, whatever the euro equivalent is, um, they're a, a relatively trivial amount. People will be more tempted to just go, oh, I'll try, give that a try. Okay, hang on. Uh, so we've got a bit of an audience here. Uh, I would like to try and gauge people who would potentially buy a piece of software Ooh, yeah. from this store. So can we have a cheer for those that would? Yeah. You would. Oh, actually, that was okay. a lot more than I expected, actually. And can we have a boo for those that wouldn't? Right. Ah, so, so, nobody so nobody would buy. Nobody has a philosophical objection to buying software. No? There's a nod at the back. Is that a nod of agreement or a nod of dissent? Okay. Exactly. Your, your nod is ambiguous. Actually, that's I did not expect that reaction. Actually, I'm 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 surprised. Yeah, I was I was expecting there would be people who really is there, does who here has, runs only a free software desktop. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and there are people uh, there are people here who put your hands up if you have got some sort of proprietary software. Um, and I'm not talking about going to minutia of sort of some vaguely incompatible hang on, binary is this, licensing block. Um, so about 50-50, really. Hang on. Um, out, out of those, um, how many people is that paid for software as opposed to non-free software? So is this paid for software? Okay, what, oh. sort, of th- what sort of things are you installing? Give, give us a shout out. Obviously, you're running Windows and a whole heap of... Uh, <laughs> Do you really want to you're ask You're exempt <laughs> from, this, from, this, from, from shouting out the software you run because yeah, we've got to finish Tony. by about half past five. So, uh, typical um, Tony to ask the Microsoft representative how much non-free software yeah. he's running. So the other, the other people who are running, uh, let's say, a Linux-based desktop with some non-free software on top of it, shout out the sort of things you're running on it. Native Linux games. Native Linux games. Mm. So, uh, proprietary license, but running native Linux. Okay. Flash. Flash. Mm. Ah, that's a good. That's a good point. Of course, it, it, yeah, but that's yeah. not pay for. No, I know, but it's proprietary. proprietary okay. okay. Anything else? That's it. Games and Flash. That's okay. it. All right. So, so do who? I mean, it, I'm trying to gauge. Is there a concern that this might motivate people to not make more software, but to make software and then put a price tag to it? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm less concerned about the fact that it's uh, fr- uh, non, non com- non-free commercial software that's proprietary. I'm more concerned about using the Ubuntu name for pay-for software and yeah. services. Given, okay. that the, given that the whole principle behind Ubuntu is it's completely free of cost. Here, have this CD and everything on it is completely free of cost. But mm. you install it and to get a desktop that actually does everything you need it to do, whether that's paying, playing games or you know, storing your enterprise level data in a database, whatever it is, you have to pay at some point. Mm. And the Ubuntu name is tied to that paying because it's, it's Ubuntu pay is what you go through within the software center in order to hand over your cash. And I think there's a, there's a line that's being crossed. And you think that's different from the Ubuntu One music store where you get MP3s of music files that you pay for because they're not essential to the operation of the system. I don't know why it's philosophically different. Right. The, the music store feels different because it's, it's integrated into the desktop and it's, and it's part of the music player. I don't know why that feels different than something that is actually branded Ubuntu and then the word pay. Mm. That feels to me different from the Ubuntu One music store, which is buy music, oh, you have to pay for it. But it, it yeah. doesn't feel the same to me. Okay, well, it, it seems to be an idea that's got a reasonably good reception here. Now, we've got Stefano from the uh, Debian project here. Is this something that Debian would ever consider, having a, a, a pay store for commercial software? No. So, <laughs> <laughs> that was a no. That was a, that was a fairly rhetorical question, I've got to admit. But, so there's, there's, that, there's that essential no, but yet it's something that a lot of people here who are either using you know, Linux versions of some sort or the other, by and large, seem to accept that but yeah it could be a revenue stream potentially for debian it, it seems that there's quite a big a potential gap there sorry is canonical selling their own software already th- at the mo- at the moment the only thing in in the store is um 
Fluendo Codex or uh, DVD player. That's not player. strictly true, actually. Uh, mm. I'm under the impression there's also a desktop background. <laughs> it's, uh, a bloody I believe good one. it's one dollar, and I think it's actually as an experiment to to sort of see the experience before release. Right, so it's for testing. Yes, yeah. Right, okay. But even so, I mean, yeah, one dollar mm. for a desktop background. So there's not much in there at the moment, but you know, there could potentially be in the future. The infrastructure is being built. I mean, it doesn't exist at the moment, so it's being built to enable people to put pay for software in that store. Hmm. The sort of Apple App Store. Other people have stores that, you know, could be compared to this. Yes. <laughs> like, uh, like... He's already said Apple. We can, we can probably say Apple. Well, I'm, I'm, not, I I'm guess. not convinced this is exactly the same. But yeah, there is a concept that you want a central place for people to be able to go to in order to easily, A, discover software. Because it's not just the fact that you want to be pe- people to be able to um, it, pay for it. You want people to be able to find the good stuff. And, you know, people don't know that there's this fantastic software for looking at the solar system in, in Ubuntu repositories and in Debian repositories. People don't even know it's there until you tell them that there's a Stellarium or whatever it's called. But it's the discovery, but also, as a side benefit, is getting revenue from selling software as well. Games, yep, yeah, ideal. Something like World of Goo, which has done well on just about every single platform there is. Um, you can get it, you know, on, the Wii, on every console, the Wii, on the PC... Um, it's probably on phones as well. I think it is. Um, yeah. And, you know, if you imagine something like World of Goo in Software Center, you could, oh, look, I've heard of that game, click, buy it. You know, that sounds great, but I just don't like the branding. It's time for the news, and tech journal Crunchgear is predicting a massive bun fight between Android, Chromos, Palmos, Windows, and Apple products, claiming that the marketplace just can't support that many players. We're talking about tablets, basically. Tablets, potentially netbooks, I guess. So in order... Well, Mids. there's two mores. There's Mego and Lenaro in there That's as well. Yeah, yeah. So how many is that? Eight no, different no. platforms? Well, uh, no, I, I think some of it's a platform and some of it's uh, an end-user experience. Okay. Is it? I don't know. Explain the difference in 30 seconds. Well, it's my understanding that Lenaro should be able to run eventually Android interface and all the other things. The oh. Lenaro is to make it work on the base hardware. Okay. Oh, okay. So it's not, uh, it's not the user stack that people would see like Android with the marketplace yeah. and all that kind of stuff. But, actually, but there's still loads of them. Yeah, and it's actually something that Android, I believe, tried to do was try to unify all these hardware manufacturers into one thing. Mm. And I, I, don't, I think people have been a bit perhaps worried about the main company behind that um, having too much the ownership. main company behind that like yeah. nobody knows <laughs> <laughs> it's a big secret Google. Alan wireless chip maker Broadcom have released a fully open source Linux driver for its latest generation of 11N chipsets is it in the repository yet is it in the know. kernel uh, I don't think it's in the kernel yet uh, I don't know to be honest oh, okay there was Good. some discussion uh, there's a new release of Ganache, the open source implementation of Flash, which boasts much improved YouTube support. You tried it? No. I did. Oh, and I tried oh, to install gold it. Star for you. And it's, it, it, so Ganache is completely open source, free Flash implementation. So you don't need the Adobe Flash player on your machine. You install Ganache. But when I tried it, there was a little flaw in the plan in that it had a dependency on the non-free NVIDIA video driver. Brilliant. Which is kind of ironic given it's completely free software. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. I filed a bug. To be fair, I filed a bug and the developer got back to me straight away and fixed it. Fair enough. Criticism has been leveled at the open source Facebook, Diaz Pora, for using the Who? viral... We, we heard about them this afternoon in a talk. Uh, the viral AGPL and requiring the copyright contributions of contributors to be transferred to the parent company, creating fears of an open core project with commercial forks. Mm. Now, there's a very interesting talk this afternoon um, about uh, some of the terms and conditions on various social networks. Um, but this is also a, a little bit worrying. Um, I'm not sure I totally agree with the viral AGPL uh, description that's going on there. But the potential for copyright contributions to enable closed source forks um, is is always there. Mm. Well, it's the open core model, which I absolutely do not have any time for. What's it's the open core model? So this is when you get the basic features for free, but if you want perhaps the business grade ones or perhaps more interesting features, then you have to pay for uh, an upgrade. 
um, and it's essentially trying to piggyback on the back of open source but not really be open source um, it's essentially proprietary but trying to use open source to get the advertisement that's mm. how I see it anyway yeah can you see diaspora going down that road I can't see it. I was going to say I can't I, see I it going anywhere so. but that was a very <laughs> cruel thing to say uh, I, I think it's, it's a big uphill struggle for it and it will um, I wish it luck but, but projects have previously um, made me not contribute to them because I didn't want to assign copyright to them. I want to maintain that. And perhaps it's my lack of understanding, but, you know, why should I? It's my code. Well, yeah. I mean, the, but MySQL have done that for years to require uh, dual, dual licensing. So they can dual license, have the commercial free version and the um, uh, proprietary supported versions. They require contributions to be assigned over to them for copyright. Mm. And now Oracle own them all. <laughs> yeah. Caster, a 3D... Per- oh, God, no. A 3D person... No, that's not right. I'm going to start again. Third. I'll tell you what, I'll learn to read first. Yeah. Caster, a third-person action shooter game, has been announced and not only cost as little as $5, including all future additional episodes, but is available on lots of platforms, including Linux. Hooray for That's games good, I don't understand a word of that. It's what a game, that game it's a on game Linux that you for get on $5. Linux. Has right. anybody tried it? Anybody tried it? No. Okay. The Swiss region of Solothurn, I hope I've said that correctly, uh, which was to migrate 1,300 civil servants to Linux desktop has called off the project, as well as complaints from users about having to dual boot. They were unable to connect their Linux systems to various databases as required. Oh dear. Well, it, what were the databases? But that's what, because well. the thing is, I've previously heard the definition of Excel to be a database. <laughs> you know, yeah. I've heard people say Access is a database. <laughs> oh. I can't, yeah. se- I can't see that there are any serious enterprise grade databases they couldn't have connected to from. It's probably that they're though. using the term database in a very generic term for right. my systems. I couldn't connect to my yeah. company's I mean, uh, the trouble is, is we don't really know enough information about this, and it would be interesting to get a full-blown post-mortem on this. Has that the, ever stopped us before? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the idea of doing a dual boot, I can understand why they might want people to do that to learn the new system gradually. But on the other hand, if you have got to keep rebooting to do some things in one OS and some things in another OS, it's just going to put your users off massively, isn't mm. it? Oh well, another one bites the dust. That's the end of the news. Um, recently, um, Microsoft released a beta version of their new web browser, Internet Explorer 9. And um, I, something came to my attention, which wasn't the browser itself, but actually um, a journalist who mentioned that she was uh, trying out um, the browser. And she got a lot of negative reaction from lots of people who probably hadn't even tried the browser. Um, she tweeted just, it, didn't she? She did. She tweeted, she said, uh, snooty Microsoft haters all over my piece. Is it really too hard to try something before pronouncing on it? Some people just don't want their prejudices challenged. Now, I know a lot of us in the community are kind of prejudiced against uh, specifically Microsoft, but also other vendors like Apple Oracle. and Oracle and you know other software companies. Mm-hmm. And... Is it warranted? Are, is it fair for us to keep that prejudice going? Should we um, not, you know, give people a chance every so often and have a look at their software and reevaluate it on a on a with with an objectivity rather than uh, keep that prejudice in mind based on their past history? Would you reckon, Dave? No, actually, I think um, I I don't think it wins anyone by being uh, prejudiced. Um, I try. To, I have an interest in getting people to use uh, Linux desktops and Linux servers. Uh, but I learned very early on that basically uh, not having uh, a rationale for, for having this opinion uh, doesn't help. If you just say, oh, uh, yeah, uh, don't use that operating system, it's rubbish, use this one. Yeah, but they, uh, might, they, might, have, they might have a rational reason for it. Uh, yeah, but the thing is, so many people don't. They hate because they want to hate. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Well, from my perspective, the reason I don't, and I mentioned this in my talk earlier on, the reason I don't use Windows is because I've had many years of supporting it and I don't like it and I prefer Ubuntu. But I have, I have there's, there's, there's historical reasons why I don't like it. Yeah, but the thing is, you've just given specific reasons for that. Well, yeah? I've given a kind of vague yeah. hand wave yes, yeah, reason. Yeah. But what, what I'm saying <laughs> I don't is, like it. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that other systems are suitable for other people, yeah, uh, but I, I certainly won't try and say, oh, you know, it's rubbish, use this one. Yeah, it's saying, 
I don't like it. You know, you're welcome to use it. I don't like it. And then, and then people seem to get interested. About yeah, but, yeah, but you're quite a nice, reasonable guy. There are plenty yeah, of people out there you. who, generally, but there are plenty of people out there who, <laughs> who are not. And they'll, yeah. like uh, Kate, who's the reporter that I mentioned, mm. she wrote an article for The Guardian and loads of people commenting on her blog and her post saying, mm. you know, don't use it. It's rubbish. There's got a past history. Without even trying it. And, yeah, without even trying it. But then why, why would I want to try... Um, hmm. you know, the certain on, things that I, I'm pretty sure I won't like. Yeah, but hang on. But why would you want to comment on it? You know, yeah, but you can't say something's rubbish unless you've tried it. Then you know that is just welcome to the internet, Dave. <laughs> and and similarly, you know, try it. You might like it, <laughs> Tony. <laughs> but, well, genuinely, you might try IE nine at work or whatever if you use Windows at work and go, oh, that's really good. Yeah, it's not. It's not just a case of liking it. There's, there's in if you've got enough body of reasons why you don't want to use it, you know, for for yeah. it, you know, it only runs on the platform that you don't run. It's closed source. It's non-free mm. software. I can't modify it. No. So you know, there, there's a clutch of reasons why I don't want to use it. It's it's. Yeah. broken standards compliance perhaps. well it's, it's but it's but vastly improved standards compliance yeah hang on i mean if we could look at skoda as a pretty good comparison for this i mean skoda, the car analogy <laughs> <laughs> oh yes the good old car analogy i mean the late 80s early 90s the skoda was was a laughing stock and they've turned that around to be a pretty good vehicle are you now. comparing microsoft to skoda i think skoda is <laughs> a respectable car now Okay, so you're okay. saying Internet Explorer is the Skoda of the browser world. No, no. I'm saying it's not fair to basically just say this is rubbish and it's going to be rubbish forever because it was, right. it's been right. rubbish in the past. Okay, so, so people should have their prejudices challenged and they should actually try stuff out. But, but no, hang on. If I don't want my, my prejudices challenged, then I won't open myself to that. You know, I might not want you to, to, to do that, you know. But for free software advocates there is the fundamental problem that you referred to before is that it's still closed source software. It could be the best piece of software in the world, whatever that might be, if you have a piece of, of proprietary software. Yeah, but you, that you, people make compromises. People it's, do make compromises. You know, it's, Apparently it's, half of our audience make compromises. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a sliding scale. You've got, you've got, you know, can you sense on one end of the scale with, you know, totally open, totally yeah. free, no non-free drivers, no non-free firmware, and then way at the other end of the scale, you've probably got someone like Apple. I guess, yeah. with a fairly closed off platform where you have to pay to be a developer for, you know, various parts of the platform. And, you know, it's the, 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 there's, there's levels in between and we kind of sit with Ubuntu somewhere mm -hmm. roughly in the middle, near a new sense than a yeah. Apple, but kind of sliding that way <laughs> <laughs> sometimes. Okay. Um, and people have to pick where they go on that line. And if and it's not just a case of is the software better, uh, is the is the software free? There's there's is the software better and does it do what I want? And it's okay. it's it's not just a linear, you know, scale from one end to the other. There's there's too many other factors people have to mm. take into consideration. But it goes both ways as well, doesn't it? I mean, it, there are people who are prejudiced against Linux free software and and, and our platform. We, we, you know, we we could be on the receiving end as well as essentially the, the giving end, if you see. This this has made me quite angry recently. So uh -oh. I I was going to buy a new Stand laptop, back. and and someone who um, possibly ill advised me, I don't know, uh, recommended I got a Mac, and uh, for the hardware, he said the hardware is really good. So I bought a Mac. Uh, I tried OS X for probably about twenty minutes or so, maybe a little bit longer. <laughs> you really gave it a chance well, then? No, no, I didn't actually, because you know I. I I don't know how to use it, and I had no interest in learning. I didn't buy it for the software. I bought okay. it for the hardware. Yeah, fair enough. But I'm actually increasingly getting embarrassed to bring it out at free software-related events. Um, pe people have actually made comments to me, and this is just as bad. You know, the fact I don't have it, you know, we're meant to be about choice, but yet if I choose to run a piece of hardware, then I get funny looks in it mentioned to me. Does that reaction change if they see you're running Ubuntu on a Mac? No, no. no. There was actually, yeah, there, there was actually I get one the same. Yeah. I've got the same laptop as Dave, exactly the same. It's very sad. We're like mm. laptop twins. We actually bought from the same place within 24 hours, didn't we? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I follow everything he does, except the flip-flops. Um, <laughs> and I get the same thing. It's like, oh, look at him with his Apple. And then even if you show that it runs Ubuntu or it's running free software... It actually makes no difference. People, people have this set because you're, it's, not, it's not about the fact that you're, you're, you're holding an Apple device. It's the fact that you've put money into a company 
or for some people it is anyway, you've put money into a company that funds all that closed source but, horrible stuff. Yeah, but there, what's the difference between that and a company which makes hardware that's got non-free drivers for the wireless mm-hmm. and like, also well, like, ships a non-free operating system? Yeah, I mean, yeah. And the same people who complain will probably buy a PlayStation that's got completely non-free software in it or they'll buy an Xbox or some other device like a PVR or, yeah, they'll, they'll have some other device. But on computers for some reason computers are completely different and you you can judge and make that judgment whereas when you buy a pvr for your home recording people make a value and judgment based on what features it has but for computers and software for some reason people don't they keep that prejudice for a long time so if i manufactured a washing machine there we go how many people and, 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 so, and the software analogy. on it was is, free is a Skoda software. too big for you to build? If you had to scale your, <laughs> how many people here would actually buy my washing machine purely because it runs free software? Nobody would buy your Nobody washing would. machine. But why do they can see your clothes? <laughs> Nobody would buy your washing. See the machine. sourcing of your clothes, Dave. is probably not going to be a pretty sight. Well, most of my clothes is still in my car because of a certain <laughs> airline. Mm. Right, fair enough. If it's your very first washing machine. <laughs> well, in the same way that Diaspora is their very first social network and nobody will go on that until they've got a long history of revisions of it and lots of people are on it as well. You know, it works the same way with software. So I'm interested to know if anybody in the audience has, has, has either been on the receiving end of, of any sort of um, discrimination or, or prejudice or kind of literally being prejudged as to your views. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Have you any chance... That, well, actually, what's it like being a, a, an open source advocate, I guess, within within Microsoft? Is, that, is there still... A sentiment against it, or so a few years ago, a few years ago, it was it was uh, it was an odd thing. You know, we'd go to a conference, people would look and they go, "Why are you here?" Right. And you know, that's changed significantly in the last four years. I mean, very very significantly. I go to a lot of open source conferences and and, and, and events, and nobody bats an eye. Hmm. Um, I, I think that both Microsoft has changed in that, but I think the community has changed tremendously. I think once we started to participate. Um, I think reevaluations happened a lot, a, a, a lot, and you know I've got a lot of really good friends um, who are, you know, free software advocates and stuff like that. And people who are, you know, the first time I met them were, you know, downright vitriolic against Microsoft, and you know, every time I see these people, we just we, we had a great time. Is it, isn't that usually the case though? It's, it's individuals, and they see the the barrier between you and them. It's like you're. You're the embodiment of the evil, you know, evil empire, and they can separate that off because you're, you know, you're you're over there. But as soon as they meet you and realise, you know, you're a real person, it's the same with uh, with most people at Microsoft. I would think most of the individual people are perfectly normal, reasonable people. You know, yeah, that's, that is true. Um, I, I think that there has been some some movement on their part because you know, I, I watch what they say these days, and they're not vitriolic you know, anymore. You know, or they'll pause before they say something negative. Or, you know, make sure that it's currently true. Hmm. Which is kind of what we're talking about, right? Is that, right. you know, hey, you, hey, Mr. Bad and Evil Company. Oh, wait, no, but you're not doing that anymore. Okay, so, you know, they'll look for something else to attack. But hmm. I think it's changed significantly. Do you think there's a still a, a passive aggressive thing where you have um, people who are very nice, sort of, you know, the people, people who, a group of people who come to conferences will sit down, have a chat, have a beer, whatever, but you still get perhaps people who are still in their basements, you know, on Twitter or whatever, still raging and doing the... Well, they're the people who comment on people like Kate's blog. Yeah, sure. Is, you know, people who yeah. have an anonymous name and they're just, they're on the internet. That's what it's like. I think that people that show up at conferences, no, they're not passive aggressive. I think that that they they tend to be very realistic. Right. You know, they're not, they're not going to go away and then start, you know, start being mean again. Um, I think the ones who are passive aggressive are often ones that never show up at a conference because that way they can, they can always be right. Yeah. You hear that, and guys? Actually, you're all right. You're all, you're all cl- in the clear. You're not passive aggressive. Uh, as a geek, that's, uh, that, that, that's quite important to me to always be right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We, let's have a list of things that you've done right. Okay. Right. Well, um, I think that just about wraps up the discussion on um, the, uh, passive aggressiveness. No, sorry. Prejudice. <laughs> so, recently, Intel announced a new scheme to sell crippled hardware and charge you extra to unlock features. Is this a marvellous new paradigm or step towards taking the power away from the consumer? So I don't know if any of you have seen this. In America, there's, there's um, stores where you can buy a computer and then you can buy a little card that has a scratch-off 
uh, number on it. Like a top-up phone, mobile phone. Yeah, like, a, phone. like yeah. A, any kind of voucher or lottery ticket. Um, and what do you what, win? What you win is level three cash and hyper-threading in your CPU, but you have to pay $50 for it. So right. you, buy, you buy essentially a CPU that has a set of features, and some of those features are, features are switched off. And you buy a card, you type a number into a website, and it switches on those features in your CPU. And there's a little Windows widget that you download to enable that. Yeah, that, that makes that happen. And it's a one-time clunk, done. Those things are now turned on. So someone who wants a very low-spec PC can buy a low-spec PC. Someone who wants a very low-spec PC that has a slightly higher performance <laughs> can pay another 50 bucks, and they're okay. done. Good thing. What do you reckon, Dave? So I'm divided. I mean, naturally, buying crippled hardware is, um, it is, you know, it makes you feel like, it's, it's like when you buy a car. Here we go. There's the car analogy. <laughs> it's coming back. It's I like was you, expecting, you know, some other household. Return, uh, <laughs> no, it's, yeah. like, it's like when you buy a car and you've got all them blanks in your car with all the yeah. buttons missing. Yeah. And you think, well, you know, I, if I just paid a little bit extra, I could have got these buttons. No, because ah, no, if I you paid a bit is. extra, you would also need to get the wiring loom that went behind it yeah, and, okay, the, okay. and the circuitry and all the so other bits. It's, it's, isn't it more like you go to, you've bought your car. This is another brilliant car analogy. You've bought your car and you have to take it to the garage and pay them 50 quid to enable the air conditioning you have installed to But that work. doesn't happen, does it? No, well, it doesn't. The thing is, we Which have... Is, yeah, well, the, I this think is what I'm saying. There isn't, on, a, there isn't a... We have seen this many times before where you buy hardware which is crippled but it doesn't give you the option to re-enable it. Now, okay, we've seen that many as? times because the, the, the simple fact is it's cheaper for a company to make one particular product and then disable features rather than, than make lots of different products. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that makes sense. Like DVD zoning, region yeah, zoning. Well, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's crippled, isn't it? Well, in many this ways. has been happening for years, and businesses have accepted it for years. But, I've worked in on. companies where they've bought a, a server that's had eight CPUs, and they're physically installed, and they know they're physically installed, but mm -hmm. only four of them are switched on. And at the point at which they wanted more performance, they phone up the manufacturer, and the manufacturer logs in, presses a button, bam, you've now got eight CPUs. So the main difference is with that is is the business home user. Now, this is to the masses. And so going back to my previous point, we've, we've, this has actually been available for a long time. Uh, the difference is, is, is the consumer can actually do the upgrade. Now, uh, see, I, I, I appreciate that there's got to be different tiers. And, you know, they, 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 they are a business. But on the other hand, I would actually feel really cheated and how long is it going to be before someone's actually found a workaround for this? Yeah, but, oh, well, okay, yeah, but you're, not, you're not target market. These are people who walk into a shop to buy a computer. Hmm. How many people here bought their last computer by walking into a shop and handing over money? Laura. Seriously? <laughs> Which, one? Which one? What, your little diddy let? Oh, your Toshiba that you're not carrying because it's broken? Right. <laughs> but if you paid a Anyone little else? <laughs> no, nobody else, just so, Laura. So basically, of all the people in the room, nobody has walked into a shop and bought their last computer. So these are people who are fairly technical people. Oh, hang people. on. Oh. Online shopping. Well. Well. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but, but, but you're... At, uh, I'm, I'm pretty friend. certain that the kind of target for these computers is the kind of people who will walk into Best Buy, yeah. Fry's... Um, PC World, Dixon's, you know, the kind of big box shifters where you walk up and go, oh, I like the colour of that one, and buy it. And next to it, there's a little stack of cards. Oh, look, I can pay £50 extra or $50 extra, and it'll be even faster. Those are target market, and that's not you. You're not the kind of person who's going to walk into a shop and buy a computer, unless it was an absolute steal, hmm. financially wise. And I think... So it, and those people would not be bothered by it. Well, I, I think people might be very sceptical about it, seeing in the shop. Another example of sort of upselling, you know, the salesman's there going, and for another 50 quid, you can have this Go Faster stripe on the side of it. And or, or like the extended warranty, people are immediately sceptical about it and they, and they refuse to have it. So somebody buys a computer, gets it home, and it doesn't quite do what they want it to do. But if they're, if they're happy to pay for uh, a computer that might be sufficient for them now... 
but then in six months time when they upgrade to watching HD video or they upgrade to um, putting all their music collection or doing some photo manipulation, which they weren't doing initially, and they think, God, this is a bit slow. Oh, I remember, I can pay 50 quid and this will be faster. And I don't have to go through the hassle of buying a whole new computer or looking at motherboards and stuff like that that are far too confusing. Mm. I can just pay a small amount of money and bam, my computer's faster. That's got to be a winner, surely. So who here would actually uh, pay that extra? I mean, what do people think? I mean, you know, someone shout out. It incentivizes the manufacturers to sell really cheap hardware, and then you're sucking into having to pay the upgrades. Yeah. And so they charge what they want at that point. So is that a, a contrasting to like vendor lock-in, if you like? You're going to be with them for possibly the next two years or so. You know, you're going to be with them maybe longer than you would have been previously. I don't know that it locks you in because you either buy it or you don't. But once you bought it, how, how do you judge whether it's any good? Do you need L3 cash? You yeah. You buy it, take it home, and then you realise it's rubbish, and then you. That's it. You, you, know, you can see, you know, um, and again, using Alex's example of his, of his mum, if she'd gone into the computer shop and the vendor's there trying to explain level three caching and hyper-threading to her. Oh, they wouldn't. She the card, I don't think the card says that on the front. I think the card says something like, boost, boost card. your computer yeah. hardware. At you which know, point, it point it becomes a bit smoke and mirrors. Yes, sir. Well, isn't that also cutting out the, uh, the, the, the hardware manufacturer getting some of the profit and, you know, diverting directly to Intel? As in, the store would get some of that profit, or well, no, the store isn't now, right? So right. You know, a fifty more, a fifty dollar laptop that a laptop that was fifty dollars more now isn't available because now Intel would stay in pocket that fifty bucks. Well, I, I, I would imagine that the the retailer gets a fair chunk of that of that because it's a card and it takes no space on the retail space. Oh, you can't buy it online. I don't know. I don't know if you can. But presumably, <laughs> presumably, he will in thirty seconds. Yeah, we, we'll, we'll have contributions. Um, presumably, the the benefit for Intel is that they only have to manufacture one type of chip. They haven't got to do a seller on a, and a full Pentium or whatever. They can just manufacture one chip and it's unlocked or it's not. But it's no it's no different than why why should we not accept this? Why should people be less accepting of this in hardware when the more direct analogy is software? People buy software or they take software that's free and then they pay. Fifty pounds to get rid of the nag screens or to get rid of the adverts. You know, you you have a, a, a phone that you download a game. Like for example, there's a Scrabble game on the iPhone, and you pay whatever it is sixty pence to get rid of the adverts. You're you're right. you're making a conscious choice to improve your experience in software with a small monetary outlay, and it improves yeah. your software. But a small monetary outlay is sixty p. If I lose sixty p down the drain I'm not yeah, going to lose any I mean that's though. a tiny 50, game if I, yeah and I lose, if I was to lose $50 I'd, I'd be more worried about it worry about it I'd, you know, I'd, we, I'd be more annoyed by it it's a, it's a more substantial investment I think most yeah, people would most, most software now most shrink wrap software there's one binary or one bunch of binaries mm. on the CD and you put a different key in and you get a new version I'm pretty sure that's the way Windows works these days you get a DVD that has the whole thing that every bit of it is on that, on that DVD and depending upon the license key you put in we're getting will nods. enable you right. to have the features. And if you okay. want to upgrade from the consumer level to the premium Business level, level you put a different right. key in, which you paid for. Yeah. So you, it's exactly the same as software where you bought the base level and you pay and you get an upgrade. And you haven't actually installed anything new. You've just typed I, in a new I code. Think that, I think the difference is uh, related to ownership. Um, uh, it's pretty widely accepted now that... <coughs> That with the software model, you quite often don't own the software. Uh, People you, don't realise that. You have a licence. You, you and I accept that. Your average user okay. thinks when they buy a CD, whether it's music or software, that they own it and they own the contents. Yeah. And they don't okay, know okay. they don't. Okay, through my eyes, I'm seeing that as I own a licence. Now, when I buy a piece of hardware, I don't see that I've got a licence to use that hardware and that can be recalled at any point. I see it as I own that hardware. Now, if I open that up and take a screwdriver to it, then I'm vo I, I could potentially void in the warranty, but that's my choice. Now, this sort of tiering of hardware, I wonder how the sort of legality and licence works in that because if I take to a screwdriver, you know, a, a, a magical screwdriver that suddenly enables that <laughs> stuff. Where, where do you buy uh, have, have I, have, Am I going to get myself in trouble? With Hogwarts, maybe. <laughs> mm. Yes. Does it not mean it's sort of the Ryanair model of hardware where you pay a base price for something that's rubbish and you 
To get something slightly <laughs> less rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> to get someone to take your rubbish away. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah. But then is that such a bad thing? How many, you know, gazillions of people fly Ryanair every year? Can't be that bad. These price comparisons are a lot harder because yeah. you're comparing a- a- AMD for the full, ADM for the full price compared to this Intel, but you need the PDF. You know. mm. Yeah, it is confusion marketing for, you know, yeah, I, I, I think that's my big worry. I don't think I've got a huge ethical problem with people selling hardware that has a, a magic switch with a magic screwdriver that um, yeah, enables certain features. I think it's the confusion that people it will, will be put out into the marketplace, and it will confuse the people who are possibly most at risk of being bamboozled by salesmen and um, end up either spending more money than they should do or not getting something that they want. Mm. They should have thought, yeah. I don't, presumably, that doesn't actually automatically enable the, the, uh, the CPU. No, it's a, it's, a, it's a microcode update for the yeah. CPU. So, it know. gets loaded at boot time. I mean, yeah. th- what Dave mentioned earlier about the idea of being cracked is, of course, actually m- probably more of a, of a problem for Intel in that, you know, Blu ray is being cracked now. DVD was cracked years ago. There are uh, DRM strippers for all sorts of formats and things out there. At some point, somebody's going to work out whatever the magic al- algorithm is to make this happen. It should be noted that this is just a trial in a select number of stores. It's one store. One process, one Pentium processor in a select number of stores in a limited number of uh, yeah. products. And if, but if it was to be rolled out, I mean, you yeah, know, then, then I'm sure there'd be people out there going... And oh look, that's how what it does works. That mean? was the noise of typing really quickly on a keyboard. Right, okay. Hence and, the mind. Can, yeah. can you type that fast? Yep. What would be worse if you had one core or one processor and there was say four different levels of upgrade? Is that even worse? I think that would be better. Because then you've got the ability to start with a real cheap computer and you've got computing for the masses and then you know, son goes away to university and rather than having a computer which is old and now rubbish and useless, you can pay the fifty hundred dollars it suddenly becomes useful again, give it to him, and it carries on life. Whereas at the moment, computers that are, you know, slow CPUs, what do we do with them? Well, we install Linux, of course. But, you know, I'm beginning to get a pile of computers now which... I will probably never use because they're lower than one gigahertz CPU. They're becoming less useful to me. But you would have used all of the computing power that that machine could have had when you bought it. Not necessarily. I mean, if, well, I might have, you but I'm have not done. target market. Uh, but you're the person yeah, who's no, got hang the on, stack. Hang on. The, the, the trouble is, you, you said target market, but the trouble is, if this is successful, then it's not going to be long before every piece of hardware is doing this and the competitors are also doing it. In yeah. which case, and then that will drive you the price will, down. If it, eventually, you will have no choice. And I don't have a problem with that. It's, okay, okay. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Come back from that one, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Alan wins, I think. <laughs> Sorry. We've got some free product to give away. That sounds, makes it sound like I'm going to do my hair or something. Got something here for you, Garrett, didn't we? When I said that's got to go on your desk at work, and okay, if you're really lucky, we might even sign it for you. That that, (laughs) that, that, that would double the value overnight. Double the value, okay. You wish. Now we got some Ubuntu hats. Who wants one? Who wants some Ubuntu hats? People see, at the back. You, see, Can we throw things? Hang on, hang on. The red hat guy, he's got his arms crossed to stop him putting uh-huh. his hands up. <laughs> what I mean is... Like That's inviting people, you to hit him with it. <laughs> two people have got to pin him down and we'll throw the hat onto his head. <laughs> I, w- I wish I was that good a throw. But, but Eddie, seriously, who wants one of these the, rather out. fetching hats? Well, I don't want it now. You want Give it. One <laughs> oh, that one then. So who wants one of these? Come on. I want to throw, throw a hat. Out. That was rubbish. Can I throw that one? You suck. All right, I'm going to do a curve. Oh, who else? At the back. Right. <clears throat> oh, look at that. That was superb. We also have a couple of Ubuntu t-shirts. These are really nice. I have a couple Dave, of Dave, I'm myself. much better at throwing One's a large and you. one's an extra large. So I'm going to throw the <laughs> large first. And I'm going to close my eyes to make it fair. This one is extra large. And I'm going to close my eyes and it's going to make no difference because I'm going to throw like a girl again. Ooh. Well done. Now, not hitting this the is actually the star prize here. Now, it was in our box of goodies. Ooh. It's a badge for IT at Cork with the name Laura CZ Tab. 
<laughs> Who wants this? Who wants to pretend to be Laura tonight and pay the bill? <laughs> That's it. I think that's all of our giveaways. Well, thanks for listening and thanks for coming to see us, all of you who are sat in front of me now. Uh, you can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, which is podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, including voicemail numbers, Twitter, Facebook, IRC channels. We're not on diaspora yet. Uh, let us know what you think of the show. <laughs> that does sound like a medication, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, go to the doctor to get my diaspora. Uh, Let us know what you think of the show or give us your thoughts about Ubuntu and the community around it. See you in the bar later, which is the Lansdowne Hotel from 6.30pm, food at 7pm. Obviously, if you're listening to this, <laughs> yeah, after the event, you, you won't be able to come, I'm afraid. If, but, if but you turn you up guys, at the Lansdowne Hotel and expect food and any other day other than tonight, yeah, it's not going to happen. Yeah, you might be able to get it, but we won't be there. Yeah, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.